<clears throat> Hello, good evening everyone. This is the regular meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education here on Monday, May 13th, 2024 at 7 p.m. here at the Downers Grove Village Hall. This meeting is being live streamed for the public on the Village of Downers Grove's YouTube channel. Melissa, will you please call a roll? Member Joshi. Here. Member Ellis. Here. Member Hannah. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchik is absent. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. Tonight, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment to the board later on in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to please fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. These can be placed in the basket over there on the table, over there to my right. Uh, I have allotted 30 minutes tonight for public comment. All right, we're going to start off the evening a little bit different today. We have on tonight's agenda a public hearing for the application for a PE waiver. I'd like to welcome up Mrs. Liz uh, Earhart for some brief comments. Good evening, board. So tonight we are asking for the approval of a renewal of our PE waiver. We are staying status quo with our current PE programming. The waiver is a request that we hold PE for our kindergarten, first and second grade students two days a week with a PE teacher with teacher directed time um, to allot for that third um, session of PE, which is part of our school code. So this waiver request is an amendment or is asking for um, a change to our approach to the school code in providing our PE um, minutes with teacher directed PE for kindergarten first and second grade the reason that we um, ask for this waiver is due to um, FTE um, um, allocations in terms of our PE department as well as physical space um, to hold PE for our primary students um, three days a week. So we do request um, that we stick with our, our current PE programming um, and that the waiver be approved this evening at the board meeting. Thank you very much. Any questions from the board before I open it up? All right, and at this time I declare the hearing open to allow members of the audience to comment on this topic. Anyone wishing to be heard, please stand. Come up to the podium, state your name, attendance area, or organization, if any, uh, for the record, and please provide your comment. Okay, if there's no one that wishes to leave a comment, uh, I now declare the hearing to be closed at 7.02 p.m. All right, we'll, we'll go back now to our regular board meeting. So we're going to start off with the Pledge of Allegiance. So I'd like to welcome up the student council from Herrick Middle School to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> Whenever you're ready. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, now at this time I'd like to welcome uh, Ms. Novotny and uh, Ms. Nglima. Good evening, board. Um, we are here for the spotlight on Herrick Middle School. Um, so first, we'd like to go over the presenters that we're going to have this evening. Um, we have Liam O'Donoghue, who is the 8th grade Vice President of Student Council. We have Garrison Chang, who is a 7th grade representative. Um, and then there's Student Council sponsors who are not here tonight, but that obviously help them in all of their Student Council endeavors are Ms. Carrie Deka and Ms. Jessica Atkins. Um, our RISE teacher is here, Billy Clevenow, and our PCA President, Kelly Rakers, and then... Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Liam. Uh, some of the fun stuff we like to do is to celebrate our culture and community at Herrick. Um, we like to do spirit weeks. For example, we like to do pajama day, Hawaii day, or baseball day. Um, we have SSB competitions. Um, for instance, a rock, paper, scissors tournament, Halloween relay race, or lip sync battle. Uh, door decorating competitions um, in the fall and winter. Lunchtime raffles where we get to win food, gift cards, hair spirit war, and other incentives. <clears throat> and we also have Santa's party, other small events. Um, the Santa's party, we get Santa's party from somewhere hidden around the school. Um, and turn it in, you get a candy cane. Um, this comes before the day, before winter break. And then we also have Leap Day Frogs, which are also hidden around the building by staff. And once you find them, you get to keep it.
Good evening, everyone. I'm the seventh grade representative, um, Garrison Jing, and today I'm going to talk about the many clubs and activities and athletics that Herrick offers. So first, we have clubs. We have Prism Club. We have Guitar Club. We have Unplugged, which is like board games, and Chess Club. Facts Club, which is Family and Consumer Science Service Squad, as well as Student Council. And all of these clubs meet throughout the year, and students can join any club at any time. And we also have these music groups in Herrick. Uh, we have the musical, which happens once a year. And we have chamber strings, chamber choir, as well as jazz band. And these meet extra early, uh, except for the <laughs> musical. <coughs> and we also have athletics, which include volleyball, uh, basketball, cross country, track, cheerleading, wrestling, and soccer, which I think is new. And we also have the Cyclastic Bowl and chess. And intramural sports are basically a more relaxed version of athletics. And you got volleyball, floor hockey, flag football, ultimate frisbee, indoor soccer, and cross country skiing, which I think is a very interesting one. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, that's all of the club's activities and athletics that Eric offers. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, well, first to say, Leapfrog Day was one of my students' favorite days. So <laughs> thank you for that. It was a, it was a hoot. So, um, thank you. My name is Billy. I'm the Rise teacher at Herrick. Um, I'm here to just talk about um, this being the first year that Herrick has had Rise. The first year our district has had Rise in the middle school. Um, so. To start off, the staff and students have been very, very welcoming to our students. Um, to be honest, we were a little nervous just because our kids went to Indian Trail and their homeschool kids go to O'Neill, so we weren't sure kind of what to expect, but they've built such strong relationships with uh, the students at Herrick, um, genuine friendships, so really positive things. Uh, our staff has been uh, very welcoming too. So. Um, this year we've also started to implement life skills um, in our curriculum, so as a team we've developed um, a scope and sequence to include life skills, um, rubrics to assess those skills which include communication, community, safety, grooming, and recreation. Um, so that's all new to the RISE program as they are getting older and we need to start working towards those things. Um, this year we've also started community trips, so you can see in some of those pictures above We've, uh, we, take, uh, we took a trip to McDonald's where they got to learn about like, the jobs um, at McDonald's. We've taken a, a trip to Jewel, learning how to shop, make grocery lists, um, plan meals, uh, the library. Um, so we've, we've started with some community trips and we're hoping to continue to build that and do more next year. Um, we've also been incorporating job skills so that again kind of goes along with our life skills that we've been working on as well. Um, and there's just been lots of opportunities for inclusion. Like I said, our staff has been extremely inviting. Um, our kids have loved being in the classrooms. Um, and there's been lots of inclusion opportunities for them to do things after school. Um, we have so many kids. So many of our kids are in a club, at least one club. We had kids perform in the play, um, sports. So it's, it's really just been a great year for uh, Rise at Hair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Kelly Rakers, PTA president. Um, so yeah, I just want to let you guys know some of the events that we put on throughout the year to help support the staff and uh, uh, students throughout the year. So some of them include the fortnightly, where it's the etiquette and dance, uh, VIP day, uh, we do the teacher appreciation week to help support the staff throughout uh, for what they've done throughout the year. And then we've also had a number of dine outs and uh, end of year celebrations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, so we're going to go over some of the data. We have the winter map data, and then we'll look at some of the IAR stuff um, that will be from last year since we haven't received the new stuff for this year. Um, so we are looking at both the math and reading scores from our winter benchmarking, which is the most recent one. Um, for math, we did have lower than expected growth for this. Um, but this is really what's driving our work with our math departments. Um, we're pushing towards more common assessments so that we're able to um, uh, judge more accurately in terms of the learning of our students. 
Um, it's also driving some of our SIP work, so um, the approach with our current plan and then also what it is that we're looking to as we're looking for the draft for next year. Um, with regards to the reading data, um, we obviously are happy with the green growth, um, but as we look to adopt, we've adopted that consistent um, resource that we're going to be using amongst all the classes. We're hopefully you know, going to be seeing even higher growth with that as we move along. All right, hang on to your seats because it's time to celebrate on this one. Our IPR <laughs> scores last year were outstanding. I really would like to highlight that overall 94% of our student body met or exceeded expected growth. 98% um, of our students met or exceeded in ELA and 91% met or exceeded in math. Wow. These scores truly speak volumes to the instruction and the instructional practices as we administer our state assessment. With continued focus on these instructional practices, we anticipate another round of fantastic scores this year. Uh, and then as we look at our school improvement plan, the three goals that we have been working towards this year, um, as mentioned previously, looking at that, um, the math and trying to make sure that we're incorporating more of those um, concepts, problem solving, particularly in math and science. We're looking at that throughout all of the areas, but those are particularly where we're focusing it. Um, with the second goal, we're utilizing the procedural writing strategies, so um, claim, evidence, reasoning, or CER, if you've had any of your students complaining about this. Um, it's really nice because it's common language that's used throughout all of the top or subject areas, so every student knows like what they're supposed to be doing. They understand the format of it, what it is, you know, the expectation. So it's really good to have them all on the same page. They understand everything all together, both seventh and eighth grade levels. Um, and then we're also implementing the tenets of be respectful, be responsible, be safe. Um, and I know our great student council representative talked about some of those sort of positive reinforcements, reinforcements that we have implemented throughout this year. Um, but that all comes from the common expectations that we communicated right at the beginning of the year. We have consistent um, expectation talks with the students, both by teachers and by administration. Um, so everybody's on the same page with what is expected in terms of behavior throughout the building. Um, and then because of that, we're able to really utilize those positive reinforcements as we move through the year. Thank you very much for having us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. it. Thank you. And for our student council members, uh, we got a couple of gifts for you. Thank you for being here tonight. We appreciate it. All right, that brings us on to our non-action uh, reports. Uh, first up is communications. Listed on tonight's agenda are three communications received by the board. Are there any additional communications a board member would like to share at this time? Okay. We have two spotlights tonight. Our first one is uh, the sixth through eight middle school transition update. So I'd like to welcome Jessica Stewart and Liz Earhart. Hello again. Um, so we are going to be giving um, an update on our 6-8 middle school model. Um, this is part of our strategic goal um, four, which is building for success as we transition to a 6-8 um, or K-5, 6-8 um, update after construction is completed. So a little bit about what we were are going to be um, sharing this evening is our strategic planning process, timelines um, of our work, and then um, how we are building our staff capacity and um, a model survey that we um, administered to our teachers um, and um, middle school staff, as well as professional learning opportunities and other next steps that we will be taking in this implementation process. So as we have shared um, through our strategic planning, our overarching goal is that we will work to ensure a smooth transition to a 6-8 middle school model for all stakeholders, especially in that first year of transition. So um, pieces of our work, we're building a steering committee, which is driving the work that all of our subcommittees is doing. That steering committee is representative of both middle schools, um, elementary schools, and our parent community. We coordinate and review our subcommittee work, and then we are ultimately the group that recommends action to the DLT for board approval. Um, our subcommittees include our scheduling and staffing committee, who is working to derive a new middle school schedule. Um, we have lots of options on the table, things that we're considering, um, looking at lists of priorities of our staff, um, priorities for our community members, our parents, our students, um, and ultimately we will be um, or presenting a um, sample schedule 
for um, consideration for our 6th eight middle schools. Then we have our student support programs, which will be working alongside that scheduling and staffing committee in terms of making sure that all of our students' classes um, are represented within our schedule and that the supports are put in place for all of our students to be successful in this transition. The next steps are going to be looking at those transitions when we move our fifth and sixth graders to, um, over to the middle school. So we will have a new sixth and seventh grade group in that year, um, in the 26-27 school year. When we are looking at that, that is two thirds of our middle school population that will be transitioning into the middle school. We will only have our eighth graders that will be um, current students. So as we're used to transitioning half of our um, student body at both middle schools, this will be two groups of students moving over. So it's a big transition, but we're really looking forward to ensuring that um, our elementary experiences that our sixth graders have are offered to our fifth graders, and then ensuring that both groups are well supported when they move over to the middle school in that first year. Um, following that, we will have li um, liaisons at both the elementary and middle school to ensure that communication is happening across buildings, as well as sharing communications with families as we get closer to that transition. So a little bit about our timeline. We've started our professional learning opportunities with our staff already, so we are offering um, professional learning to um, our sixth grade teachers as well as our middle school staff. The reason we're doing that is because a lot of our initial professional learning is on adolescent learners, and adolescent learners are 10 through 14 year olds, which is that, that um, age group that whether the students are already in the middle school or not, we want to ensure that we are supporting our adolescent learners to the best of our ability. So that is where our professional learning is starting. We're hoping to have that schedule framework completed in the fall of 2024 so that we can get an approval and start planning on staffing. Our student transition planning will also start happening in the fall of 2024, and that will include our middle school principals and our elementary principals to ensure that we have strong communication back and forth across elementary and middle school buildings. We will begin working on that student support structure after the schedule is completed in the winter of 2025. Then we will finalize um, staffing and facility utilization in the spring of 2025. That will give us an entire year of transition work with all the pieces put in place and we can really focus on what our students are doing in that year um, prior to the movement of full implementation, which will happen in fall of 2026. Thanks, Liz. Um, it may seem odd to talk about building the capacity of staff who do this work very effectively every day, as we just heard in the previous presentation. Uh, this work is not about an underlying assumption that someone or something is wrong. Uh, it's really more about a real commitment to recognizing the changing needs of today's adolescent learners um, and creating a structure that successfully supports them. Uh, it's, it's about being inclusive in our approach of developing that responsive model that has the flexibility to serve the needs of students today and for years to come. For any of us who have taught at this level, have, have a child at this age, or remember these awkward years ourselves, we know that we can't define any one thing as developmentally appropriate. As our students' brains are growing more during this time than um, any other time in their lives, other than infancy, and so they're all reaching those uh, important milestones at varying times. Um, and that's why middle level education is so important and so unique. The committee started their work really diving into this research. Um, one of the places we turn to is the Association for Middle Level Education, and specifically, uh, as Liz previewed, their measurement tool that helps to gather implementation data on our effective middle school model from those who helped to create it, our faculty and staff. The tool is not about whether we do or don't do something, um, but rather it reflects on the shared agreements uh, of the strength of any one of the many practices um, of that middle level education created by, by our staff. Uh, to kick off this work, we met with faculty on two occasions to preview key terms and concepts around successful organization and leadership, curriculum, instruction, and assessment, <coughs> oh, Thank you. And, and culture and community. The idea was to go back to the roots of what middle level education is so our data was as telling as possible. The survey itself was an intense tackle and staff were given PLM time to complete it as it asked staff to weigh in on 
evidence associated with 144 different exempt exemplar practices. Those results were just shared back with us last week, and so we're really looking forward to diving into them more deeply and helping to figure out our pathway. Um, those survey results are gonna assist the steering committee in identifying targeted areas for professional learning, as well as um, really finding those places for celebrations and extensions. Uh, as we said, that work's already begun, and we're really um, doing a, a really intense training coming up in this May Institute Day on the 30th. Uh, we're being very intentional about including those sixth grade uh, staff in all of these opportunities. Uh, we aren't training on a particular model. Um, it, it won't matter in the end if that sixth grade teacher ends up moving to the middle school in, in 2026 or 2025, 26, or if he or she stays at the elementary level. Um, the training is really for anybody who teaches that young, young adolescent child, uh, as we heard starting at uh, age 10, uh, where kids are really said to be changing by the minute. Um, it, we're really going to focus instead on how to meet the needs of those, those changing children um, and being able to reach, teach, and respond. In all of this, uh, we have not forgotten about the important work of our elementary uh, schools. Uh, tonight we're sharing the middle school update, but elementary planning has been in tandem with this as we work to ensure that the 5, 6, and 6, uh, 7 transition plan supports the needs that will uh, be upon us in the 2025-26 school year and beyond. Uh, we've got strong communication, um, working through our representative liaison structure for all our schools and family in the making. So we're really looking forward to continuing that work. All right, any questions or comments from the board? My questions are on logistics. Um, are there any, I'm just trying to think about um, any, any um, bumps in the road that we might have to make the transition from the staffing perspective? Um, is every, I don't really know how I guess the certification works, but if you are a sixth grade teacher in an elementary school, do you have a middle school endorsement? I mean, is, is it, so is it be easy just to pluck them all up and move them over, or are we gonna have to do some more creative shuffling because of the way different people might be endorsed? Yeah, I think it's a good question. I'm gonna let Justin reply, but we've already been working on this. That, that's kind of a yes and. So certainly many of our sixth grade teachers do have endorsements. At this point, I've already met with every individual teacher who currently teaches sixth grade and had a conversation about what are your hopes. And then we've had a conversation about how does your hope align with what your endorsements currently are and what our anticipated space is when, when that move happens. You know, the, the really, until we get that full schedule model built we can't be precise with that but you know there are some teachers who have said my strong preference is to stay in the elementary world and so then we're trying to with retirements and movements that may happen make some of those things happen early so that we're not scrambling there are a couple other teachers who have said my strong preference is to teach middle school math and so then they've had some of we have had one who's already completed an endorsement over you know the past several months to make sure that that they are lined up to be able to do that so it's it's certainly it's I wouldn't say it's it's easy in the sense that it's just all going to line up perfectly, but we, we started that process actually over a year ago at this point to make sure that we are prepared so that even by, by this time next year, we really can almost predict where everyone who's currently teaching sixth grade is going to be so that they, they have a full year, hopefully, to be preparing with attending professional learning in their content area and things like that going into that next year. Does the, dis and the district has a unilateral right to, to assign staff? Yes, okay. we, I mean, we are essentially a, a certified teacher is guaranteed a, jo a job, not a right. position in any given year. We saying. certainly, we, we do our best not to exercise that right in a way that would of make course. people unhappy. We want, we, we want, we want to find people in a place that they are excited to be because that's, you know, but, but in the, at the end of the day, if we had to put someone in, in a, in a less preferred position, even for a short period of time while we made this transition, we have the right and the ability to do that. Right. And then my other question is around, um, you said we're going to be kind of, um, talking about staffing and allocations um, in the spring of 2025. So presumably we'll be able to, as a board of education, review the final, um, the final outcome of that conversation just so we can make sure that it aligns with our, our five-year plan. Yeah. That is correct from, from a financial end, and also um, that's one of the benefits of, of the timeline that doesn't just get laid out is we have a whole year to review that and to really put it under the microscope to make sure because in addition to the classroom teachers, we also have uh, other areas such as PE and music and those where we'll be taking some of that allotment that will no longer be utilized in sixth grade at the elementary school and then 
putting that in the uh, middle school <coughs> for uh, sixth grade. Right. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? That was very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have a second spotlight tonight, and this is on Professional Learning Mondays. Uh, Mr. Justin Sissel. So tonight we are bringing back um, the Professional Learning Monday concept that was first presented in the, the spring of 2019 with uh, the hope of just sort of looking back at what did we intend to accomplish with this early release Monday for professional learning when we first presented it. How have we done on that? And, and what are we doing to make sure that we are continuously looking at this model for improvement and effectiveness and efficiency as we go through, recognizing that while this has become part of the fabric of the way we operate as a district, it still has an impact on every District 58 family every week as we have a, 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 an irregularity in our schedule from the other four days. So looking back at when we first came to the board and said we would like to explore this model of early release Mondays for professional learning, you'll see now pre-district branding slide decks. We said that the, you know, <laughs> what, why, did, why did we need this? What were we looking for? And so we were looking ahead or currently at all of the curricular implementations and updates that were on the horizon. At that point, we couldn't even definitively say we had math and social studies coming, but we were anticipating that. We talked about the need to continuously improve our professional practice and to make sure that we had the opportunity to, to, to move into and provide the highest possible quality student experiences, which really meant making sure we could have consistent and timely application of new learning for our staff. Consistency was a, a big word back then to make sure that we weren't just teaching teachers things, but we were making sure that the application was becoming consistent, and giving teachers the opportunity to learn together and work together so that, again, there was that opportunity for implementation together, which yielded that fidelity and consistency. We talked about Mondays falling into three broad categories, district-driven or district-directed, building-driven, and teacher-driven, and some of the examples of the types of things we intended to put into those three large categories. And then we talked about what would that look like in terms of the impact on instructional time. And so we talked about maintaining the institute days, but at that time we had in the calendar um, additional half days where we would have students attending in the morning and not attending for a full afternoon. We had put a teacher work day in the calendar at that point, which was a non-attendance day for students. And then we also talked about the reduction in use of substitute teachers in that initial presentation, all ways to recognize that while early release meant a, a, a loss in instructional time, there were places where we were recapturing instructional time from the calendar as well. Later in February 2019, we, we took some of those questions we got from the board and got a little more specific on what really, how would we be reducing some of that impact of substitute usage. And so this slide was up there where we talked about reducing one of those grade level meetings for kindergarten through sixth grade. We talked about reducing the need for middle school exploratory committee meetings that were ongoing at that point because that group could meet during professional learning Mondays. We talked about committee work and student data meetings and teacher meetings and, and really just looking for any of those opportunities to use the PLM time for things that we had previously only had the, the option of pulling teachers out of class to accomplish. And we also used these quotes in a couple of different presentations just to remind ourselves that this is a research-based approach, that idea of effective professional learning, creating the time and space, and, and, and all of this was not just driven by something that people thought would be a good idea, but it was rooted in research and best practice to ensure that we are allowing time for quality professional learning that meets these um, criteria for our teachers. So fast forward, what has it looked like? Those district-directed professional learning Mondays or PLMs, we certainly have accomplished quite a bit of curricular implementation in the past several years. And again, we're, we're focusing a lot on post-COVID because that really, COVID did take away some of that scheduling and the Mondays look different. But if you look at everything that has been implemented, I, I think it's fair to say as someone who lived in that world for most of the years of the PLMs and can continue to, to work through it and, and look at it, we would not have been able to accomplish the level of implementation, the fidelity of implementation, and, and, and what we have with 
out that time given both to the ability to really work through and, and unpack the units with support and have the third grade teachers together looking ahead at what is the next unit of instruction in math, in social studies, and how am I going to implement it, and then have them also have time in a subsequent week to be able to think about how is it going, what am I, you know, what, what specifically now am I applying that I learned in a larger group, and I can say that because the very, the, the, the time we implemented ELA previously, when I first began in the curriculum department, we didn't have professional learning Mondays, and one of the first reflections we had when we started the ELA committee again was that the fidelity of implementation wasn't the same as it was for the, the curriculum adoptions that came later, and, and one of the key differences was the time that we had allocated through professional learning Mondays. When we talk about the other things that we've done at the district level, the instructional strategies that we've been able to present and apply as a result of that time where the district has been able to bring in training on executive functioning, on trauma-informed practices, and to also have some very specific trainings and interventions and, and pieces that are designed for specific groups of people, but again, capturing some of these times, not only for the initial trainings, but time to come back together as a group and reflect on how is the implementation, how is the usage of some of these very specific programs going across the district, especially when I might be the only person in my building or one of two who is trained in a specific program, but now I have the opportunity to meet with a job-alike group and talk through how is that implementation going, what does that look like in practice. At the building level, we really have moved so many of those data conversations about student data, both in tier one and for specific groups of students and individual students into that Monday time. We've, we've been very deliberate about saying intervals of time between which these conversations will happen to make sure that we're providing the time and space for those conversations to take place without trying to fit them in during the day or without doing what we did many years ago, which was getting three or four full day substitutes and rotating teachers through to try to find time to have those conversations. In the past several years, we've also significantly increased the number of committees that we expect <coughs> to see at each of our buildings to make sure that all of the work that needs to be done at the building level is happening. And you can see, you know, these buildings are required at each of, or excuse me, these committees are required at each of our 13 buildings. And so dedicating some of the time on these Mondays where not just one, but a few of these committees can meet during a given Monday because different staff are involved in different committees allows time and space to make sure that this work is continuing in and, and being focused upon knowing that our, the time we have before and after school, particularly well, at both at the elementary and the middle school, is truly limited. It also gives building administrators time to focus on professional learning and reflection on implementation of the building specific school improvement goals. That's another process that has improved in and become enhanced both in fidelity and implementation over the past several years. And this is a place and a space that time has been given to make sure that that can happen at each building. The other portion are those teacher directed professional learning Mondays. And this is something that has continued to evolve. but. It's important to know that this isn't just teacher plan and preparation time. In fact, it's, it really is very different than that. Teachers fill out a form prior to that day indicating their focus for a teacher-directed professional learning Monday and how it connects to their own professional goals for that year and how that connection happens. And so you'll see collaboration activities between teachers, often within the same building, but again, depending on that teacher's role, often across the district, more and more virtually to maximize time on those days, but often coming together as well. It it provides, as I mentioned earlier, that reflection space for curricular implementation. And for our teachers who are in more specialized areas, who maybe aren't spending as much time with those district-wide curricular implementation, it gives them that opportunity to seek out more personalized, professionalized learning that really, again, gives them that immediate implementation of specific strategies, opportunities, programs that will help with their specific content area. The other piece is maintaining that instructional time for our students by keeping teachers in the classroom. And so we did what we said. We reduced that grade level meeting time for K-6 teachers. We also have made it so that each district level committee is using one Monday for one of their meetings. So if, a, if the social studies committee had met four times a year previously, they are meeting three times a year where, they're, where we are taking half day meetings, but then one of those meetings has shifted to a professional learning Monday. As I mentioned, data meetings are happening. Middle school departments collaboration are primarily happening during the professional learning Mondays. All of that curriculum implementation and training that I mentioned, again, the, the, the depth of 
time and focus needed is happening over several Mondays rather than what would have been half-day trainings in our previous model. And again, in general, we're just seeing committees are being able to sunset because we are getting the work done and we are implementing and we are moving forward in that curricular replacement cycle. So, you know, have professional learning Mondays ended the use of substitute teachers? No, and, and I don't think that was ever the hope or the vision because there is still work to be done that requires some of that curricular committee time and some of that focused committee time that, that does continue to meet. But it certainly has given us a lot of space to reduce that over the course of many years. I think another important reflection, this was in the um, one of the slides in, in February of 2019 where we kind of said, so the first eight, nine weeks, here's kind of what it could look like. There's a building directed day, then maybe we would split with, you know, half the schools would do district directed and half the schools would do teacher directed because we want to make sure we can spread our, our administrative and coaching staff around to support those district directed days. But we had a pretty straightforward, simplistic model of how this might work. Well, six years later, as we plan for next year, this is how we have to look at this model. <laughs> and I think this is, this, what this illustrates is the level of specificity and thoughtfulness and precision that is really going into the planning. And so I think sometimes you, you hear anecdotally in places, well, we put something in place and we kind of set it and forget it, and it may lose its effectiveness or its efficiency. And I think what you see here is it's actually quite the opposite. We have year over year continued to try to get more targeted, more specific, more detailed with the way we're planning these days to ensure that all of our 420 something certified staff members are having a meaningful, enriching experience each and every month. How do we know that? Because we ask the same few questions every month. And so in the 21-22 school year, we asked each Monday, how valuable was today's professional learning experience for you personally? Just to be clear, one was not at all valuable and five was extremely valuable, so we, we kind of know where that Likert scale is. 7,000 or so responses, this, this was taken, so this was that year in the aggregate. The second question we ask is, how relevant was today's professional learning to your role in the district? The third question we asked was how productive was today's professional learning? Was the time used efficiently? That was 21-22. Here are the same questions in 22-23. How valuable? I'm gonna go kind of quickly here so you'll see the visual. How relevant? How productive? And then this year, You'll see less responses because we started, a, we tried a different distribution system that didn't capture everybody, but it's still 3,500 responses and we still have a few Mondays to go. How valuable, how relevant, how productive. And so over the course of three years, we're never gonna, I would never expect to see 100% of people in the four and five column. There's always gonna be a day that was off for somebody in some group, and we do review that feedback. But in general, we're seeing consistent positive feedback, and it's not just on one type of Monday. That's across all three types, district, building, and teacher. As I mentioned, we really do want to make sure we're looking at balancing the needs of every group, and so we do look annually at how can we best construct that calendar to maximize time, and how do we balance the availability of staff. One of the things that we learned early on was it's great to have all 300, 400 people available for professional learning at once, but we don't have 100 people to support that professional learning and teach that professional learning, and so how do we balance our administrators, our coordinators, our <coughs> coaches to support that? So that's become something we've really looked at different ways to do that. We also want our instructional assistants to be a part of this in meaningful ways where we can. Not every Monday, but targeting those specifically and making sure that we're giving our instructional assistants advance notice to become part of that. We invite them to a certain number of Mondays throughout the course of the year to be part of that professional learning as well. Things that we can celebrate, again, I mentioned that curricular implementation, the ongoing collaboration for teachers, the ability for teachers to support and, and implement, or access support, excuse me, and implement new learning. That consistency, I think, is something that, you know, we have talked about for many, many years, and, and this is really a space where we can, we can point to and say, you know, no one thing yields one result, but, but that ability to get to consistency in teaching and learning has really been a, has really benefited from 
this time and this space. And then again, just showing that yes, there is always room to grow and there are always things we can take feedback upon, but we are seeing that this has generally speaking been and continues to be a positive experience for us, a positive experience, excuse me, for our staff. So we wanted to share this with the board tonight and then in June there will be an opportunity for the board to just sort of formally reapprove the concept of Professional Learning Monday which connects to the concept of Early Release Monday going into the 24-25 school year. I don't think I have a question slide but this is the point where I would <laughs> <laughs> Well thank you Justin. Is there any questions or comments uh, from the board? Uh, my comment would be um, you know as a as my, my last question about FTEs and, and, and moving people from place to place was about I think the board needs to look at the, uh, the staffing proposals to make sure that that's financially sound. So our job is to be, is to be looking over um, you know, the, the community's investment in the district via their, their property taxes. Um, but also, like this was, this was not a no-brainer back in 2019 because there's a cost to it, an intangible cost, which is our students' time with their teacher. Um, and I am pleased to hear that this is, um, you know, I think I think you came in and your team has has done a good job in implementing this. I think like the direction at the time was, this has to be meaningful. This has to be um, time well spent that um, validates the the investment of of that resource into it. So I'm I'm very happy to hear that our teachers are finding it meaningful, um, relevant. Um, Productive, and that you know we can make the argument that this is impacting student growth and achievement. Um, but it's you know I, anecdotally, we, we we know that other districts this time is not used well. It's kind of a waste of time. But um, that's not the 58 way. And I'm really glad. Uh, you know, thank you to everybody here to to uh, making sure that 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 important part of that came to, came to light five years later. Thanks. And it really is a team effort. I am, I am presenting tonight more because I was the one who wrote the 2019 slides and sort of brings it to that. But, but, but the truth is that this is really mostly in the hands of Liz and Jessica. Now they just already had their turn tonight. So but I, it is truly a team effort in continuing to develop this and make sure that it does stay meaningful and relevant. Yeah, well, thank you, Justin. And thank you, Greg, for, for the points that you were stating because it, for those of us that were around, this was not an easy decision. Anytime you're taking minutes away from kids in the classroom, it's a, it's a real challenge. Um, and the level of seriousness, I, you know, we laughed when that, that slide went up with the schedule. But one of the things that we've had several conversations was, I don't want this to kind of be a set it and forget it, because we do see that in a lot of other districts, and the value t tends to go down. And if we're taking this time from students face time with their teachers, we want to make sure they're coming a lot of value and that's actually improving the time that they do have with their teacher, which includes things like reductions in, in substitutes. I know we'll never get to zero, but I, I love that that's going that way. I also like that we talked about the idea of, of sunsetting committees. One of the challenges can be is groups and organizations can be really good at creating committees, but never letting them go. Uh, so I, I think that's really good news. If we're getting to the point that we feel like we've accomplished something, even if that gets spun up a few years later because we want to revisit it, bringing something to a conclusion I think is, is, is very good. I also really do appreci uh, appreciate the insight that you brought now that the ELA committee is coming back and that they felt like they've seen the implementations of the other curricular programs we've done compared to the ELA ones that were done prior to this implementation. Um, I think that gave me a lot of insight to, um, you know, on the usefulness of you know, keep up the good work and I think we'd like to continue to see uh, more of this kind of uh, check-in uh, on, on this as well but uh, yeah I think I, I think this has been great thank you Appre appreciate this slide with uh, Hoover built that probably needed some Excedrin when it was all over because, um, <laughs> but it, it was very helpful to see how you were differentiating it doesn't look like you were just like blanketing stuff it looks like it was very thoughtful and thought out so I agree with what they both said about not setting and forgetting it, and the fact that the proof is in the pudding with these uh, exit slips. So, thank you very much for that work. Any other comments or questions? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, in my day job, we sometimes we will often lead professional development for teachers, and we'll often set learning objectives for the space. And so, I'm interested in. Uh, I love the exit tickets because that's consistent. It's true for every space, and then I wonder for some of these spaces that are 
where there's a direct learning objective intended, do we also look for to see if there's learning outcomes that are related to those? Uh, that's right. So we do. We don't necessarily ask. Yeah, again, we tried to keep a consistent format there, so we don't necessarily ask because, again, on a given week, you may have teacher direct, and you may have some people in different kinds. But I think you know, as we look to, if we're doing a district directed day, for example, where we're leading a. Um, a preview of the next writing unit, for example, which is what, what some of our implementation work was this year. Then our coaches are going to meet with Christine Priester, our curriculum coordinator, and Liz in the week after that and say, okay, how, how did that, how do we feel like that went, at least from our perspective? So we're getting some feedback from the room, but then there's also a lot of processing happening with our team and thinking about how, how, did, how did that go for us? Do we need to continue to do it? I think that that example is actually one that that process has gone so well that we're taking it and using it for the way we're going to do and the way we're going to use PLMs through ELA this coming year. So that's, that's a place where those targets were, were hit and felt, you know, because we also, what, what's not up there is we give an open-ended question or two for each exit slip as well. And so we do review that. There wasn't that, I didn't try to put that into the presentation, but that's a place where, again, we don't necessarily ask that question specifically, but you will see some of that feedback in both directions. Sometimes it's, I think you missed the target here, and sometimes it's, this is exactly what I needed to be able to teach this writing unit next month. Thank you. Yep. All right. Thank you very Thanks much. Sir. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Next up is reports to the board. First up, superintendent report. Dr. Wilson. So first, I know that they're at home probably studying, but thank you to the Herrick students. I thought they did a wonderful job over the last several weeks. We've had the opportunity to meet with our middle school students, whether it was for a groundbreaking ceremony, whether it was for Select 58 or opportunities like tonight. And I just continue to be amazed at the quality of our middle school students, how well spoken they are, and just their preparation and hard work. So we want to thank them. I also want to thank the staff and PTA of Herrick for a wonderful presentation. Herrick is by far our biggest school, so it's always nice to hear the great things that are going on over at Herrick Middle School. I also want to thank our assistant superintendents. Um, we've got a really good team in the district office. They put a lot of work into the presentations, and so uh, thank you uh, for another great night of presentations. Personnel update for this week, or this month, I should say. Um, we are very happy uh, this evening to uh, recommend to rehire a significant number of teachers who were with at the April board meeting. Uh, we're grateful to our building secretaries and admin for their efforts to uh, really track down families who hadn't registered and, and get that complete because it does allow us to complete our staffing process. So thank you to everyone for completing that. Uh, in addition, we're also hoping uh, to hire some new teachers into the district and we'll continue the hiring process for teachers and instructional assistants throughout the summer uh, through our normal work. In terms of curriculum instruction, I know Liz talked to you about the PE waiver uh, coming up forecasting uh, next month and then into July for approval. We've been reviewing and updating our e-learning plan, which is up for renewal next school year. I can't believe it's been three years already, if you remember that day in the O'Neill cafeteria when we first started discussing this. Um, having an e-learning plan in place provides the district with flexibility to call an e-learning plan in lieu of an emergency day. Um, especially right now when we're in construction and we really can't afford to extend the school year into the summertime. Having a plan in place does not mean that we always have to use an, or utilize an e-learning day, but it does give us that uh, flexibility. So we'll continue to recommend to have that flexibility, especially during construction. I do recognize that um, our community, our, our teachers, everyone has um, you know, evolving views, including myself, on e-learning and the benefits to e-learning, especially uh, for an elementary district. Uh, so we're going to continue to discuss that um, at the board level, at our teacher level, with our families, the superintendent's community advisory council. But this is definitely something we need in place while we do construction. So thank you, Liz, for working on that. And again, we'll bring that for approval at the July meeting. It's always nice to talk about snow and those things in July when it's 100 <laughs> degrees out. Uh, we're diligently also planning for summer school. Session one will uh, include current grade level skills for students and is in the final year because that is something that we use ESSER funds. So that's one of those learning loss objectives that we've been utilizing our ESSER funds for. And since ESSER funds expire by September 30th, this will be our last summer of utilizing ESSER funds. Of course, we'll continue to have conversations about do we want to continue that and if so, can we afford that out of our district funds. So that'll be an ongoing conversation uh, that we will have. Session two of summer school is set to run in late uh, June and early July, uh, focused on preview of upcoming grade level standards and art appreciation. Uh, this fine, and that's obviously something that parents can sign their children up for. 
The final session will be summer band and orchestra program, and uh, that will that's kind of a jump start for the upcoming school year. It's, it's amazing to see how many of our students, though, are enrolled in our summer uh, musicals. And then for me, it's always nice I get to go to all the concerts along with Liz Earhart, and we see all of the uh, final product of that hard work. And so I want to give our uh, music department a shout out because they do a really, really nice job. In terms of finance on the agenda, this is an annual thing. Uh, you will see the Rexnard abatement. This is a partial abatement of property taxes uh, for the expanded facility at the Rexnard Aerospace Facility in Ellsworth Park in the middle of Downers Grove. If you recall, both District 99 and 58 agreed to this abatement in order to keep and expand this facility in Downers Grove. This is the fifth year out of a 10-year abatement, so we're already halfway through that. I think that was an example of really the districts working with the village and working with the Downers Grove Economic Development Corporation to keep jobs here in Downers Grove, but then to also recognize that school districts still need to have funds. Uh, a lot of times when you see abatements, it's for 20 year periods where uh, no one's paying anything. This is quite a different uh, arrangement and we're very happy with how it's proceeding. Technology, uh, the update for uh, this month is the technology department has been planning for summer work and projects. This summer will include collaborating with the maintenance department and our construction management firm to ensure that technology can be moved and then reinstalled. In addition, we're also working closely with the cable installer in our phase one elementary schools to ensure this project is successful. We'll also work on typical projects, which will include uh, student device fleet, uh, setting those up for the 24-25 school year. So the technology department is very busy over the summer. Uh, you know, making sure that everything is ready to go uh, for the upcoming school year. We know how important that is on day one to make sure that our teachers have everything they need to teach the students and the students can be successful. Special services, I'm going to combine my SASSET report and the special services report tonight uh, because it's all about SASSET. This past Monday, our special, our special education cooperative, SASSET, announced several significant changes for the upcoming school year. This is a result of the strategic plan at SASSET, and they announced these to better serve the community and optimize learning environments. Uh, they've reassessed their classroom space and made strategic adjustments to benefit all students. For the upcoming school year, some program locations have been updated due to changes in classroom availability within the current districts and we're a great example of that we house a program at O'Neill that we're not able to house during construction so SASID has been working on alternate locations so here are some of the new programs SASID is excited to introduce a new structured learning environment SLE program it's an innovative approach tailored for students requiring significant communication social development and academic functional learning support Similarly, to enhance support and educational opportunities, SASA will be integrating the Southeast Alternative School Program and the Directions Program into a unified initiative called the Pathways Program. And then finally, SASA will launch Supportive Medical Needs Program, or SMNP, and that's designed to provide a comprehensive and integrated approach for students requiring specialized medical support. So one of the things we saw was that SASA was very fragmented in certain areas, and so how do we use unite those have the services in the same location so we can better serve our students especially those students with nursing needs it doesn't make sense to have a nurse travel to six different spots if we can have that all in one spot then you can have the nurse there uh, the entire time so lots of good work going on at SASSET I want to commend Jessica and her team um, you know while we're excited to see these changes we also recognize for our families that are in the SASSET program change can be challenging to understand tough to navigate and so Jessica and her team will continue to work closely with all of our families to make sure uh, that they understand the new names for the program, what, what's going to be offered and how we can help them uh, navigate new processes. In terms of facilities, if you're driven by our middle schools, which I know many of our uh, staff have and so is our public, uh, construction continues to push uh, forward. The heavy rains last week did delay much of the work at Herrick. However, the water main installation has continued. The foundation walls are up for the Herrick kitchen. Uh, addition on the north side of the current cafeteria, sanitary sewer work towards the new library addition is ongoing and near completion. In the O'Neill storm sewer connections in the east road, we were completed and foundation work continues for the south kitchen area, main entrance, and the science room additions on the east side of the building. Uh, so things are going very, very well. I want to commend uh, Kevin Bardo uh, for really the amount of knowledge that he has to know in all these different locations. Uh, it's pretty fascinating to see him do this. Uh, Todd is supporting him as well, and uh, so is Jeff Newstead, but just a great deal of work and a lot of extra hours, so we really thank them for that. 
For elementary schools, continual refinement of the plans and preparations are taking place with an emphasis on the packing and move out process, which can always be challenging in a school district because we want to keep those rooms available to the very last minute. Everything has to get packed up in a rush and then it all has to be brought back in a rush and so school can start on time. So if you were to go to the phase one elementary schools, you will see lots of boxes and crates in preparation uh, for that move. And you'll also see some of those Connex boxes outside of the schools starting to appear because that's where we'll put the stuff and uh, then we'll bring it back in uh, similar to what we did uh, during the pandemic. I also want to highlight that the second shift work uh, kicked off from 4 p.m. until 11 p.m. and uh, the Bully and Andrew superintendents are working with them. Uh, we started that shift earlier uh, than just waiting to the summer. Again, it provides some insurance for us to just make sure that we get as much of that work done ahead of time so that we can start on time uh, in August because August 16th will roll around very quickly for us in District 58. I'm still not sure we're prepared to get out in May because that really hasn't happened. So I think people just subconsciously are still planning, oh, I got three or four more weeks, but then August 16th will certainly roll around uh, very quickly. In public relations, I do want to highlight the Henry Puffer Podcast Club. It has been just a wonderful thing uh, that has been taking place for several years in our school district. Christine Reynolds uh, has done a wonderful job incorporating that into uh, Puffer. But they've started to expand from District 58 and getting a lot of recognition. And so just last week, they uh, traveled to Springfield uh, and they were able to showcase their work. And our local representatives, Tara Costa Howard and uh, Ann Stava Murray met them, as well as Senator Curran, to really highlight uh, their work. If you haven't had a chance to tune into the podcast, I would certainly encourage you to do. It is amazing to see here you have these young kids really mastering the art of interviewing adults from all different uh, areas, even sometimes high school students from Downers Grove, and uh, they just do a tremendous job, and Christine is a great leader, and we wanted to highlight her in the superintendent's report as well as the students. Uh, whenever you're getting recognized at the state capitol for great work, I think that is certainly worthy to bring up in the uh, superintendent's report, and uh, all the credit goes to Christine and the students, and uh, you know Mark Leapart, the principal for some this work. Uh, they had a great time in Springfield, which I've been to Springfield many times and I can't say I always have a great time. So, um, <laughs> Select 58 was also something that we just did on April 22nd. We celebrated and honored 58 eighth graders with the Select 58 Recognition Awards at Herrick. As you know, the awards are annually sponsored by the Education Foundation of District 58. The students were awarded certificates and gift cards by the foundation. It was great seeing the students. One of the highlights of that night is we have a former uh, student at uh, O'Neill and Herrick. We alternate each year. They come and they talk about the value of service in our community uh, prior to them going to college. So it's always nice to see our alumni come back this year. Grace Stapleton, Fairmount, O'Neill, and now Downers Grove South talk to the students at Herrick. So that was really neat. Uh, then the foundation also hosted its first ever bougie uh, bingo. I was a little nervous because I really wasn't sure what bougie meant, but uh, <laughs> we still uh, were able to go there. I want to thank uh, Dr. Ike Miller. He's also a liaison uh, to the foundation board as is member Doshi. Uh, it was a very well attended evening. We had a lot of fun at the Moose Lodge with our first ever uh, bingo night. We had several principal guests and had craft. Uh, Lucky Wagner, Lauren Humphreys, and uh, Danielle uh, Bongiorno also came uh, to call out the numbers. And John Hansen from WGN joined us. Uh, he also helps us with the Grove Express race on Thanksgiving. So it was nice to see the whole community out, especially on a Friday in May. That's always challenging for scheduling. Um, and uh, the foundation did a great job with that event. All that money comes right back to our teachers and students in the form of grants and other opportunities. So again, we just wanted to highlight the work of the foundation and talk about all the great things that are going on uh, with that. This will be our last board meeting of the uh, school year. It's kind of weird to say that because it feels like we have a lot of time left, as I alluded to earlier. But I do want to take this opportunity to thank the board for their support. I want to thank the district office team for their hard work. And then, of course, all of our staff in the buildings for all of their hard work to make it a successful school year. Uh, we will, we're already busily preparing for next school year. And uh, we have everything in place to be up and running back in August. And uh, just cross your fingers that all goes well with construction this summer. Uh, we will we'll be on top of it. Any questions for me? Questions, comments? Thank you, Kevin. All right, that brings us to the monthly business and the treasurer's report. So, Mr. Todd Drayfall. Welcome. Good evening. If you look at the report, you'll note that uh, we are at our low cash point. Uh, it's that time of the year. Uh, fortunately, or unfortunately, um, the tax bills did go out on time. And those uh, do, I think the first due date is June 1st. Um, so 
uh, if everyone could remind everyone to pay and pay early, um, they do. The, the treasurer's office does an early distribution, so we will receive uh, an initial amount in the next week or so, um, which will help us. Uh, Forty percent or better of our annual revenue comes in in essentially what is the last 40 days of the school year uh, or fiscal year. So uh, we're at that point, we're at that low piece, and from this point we, we, you know, we will receive those funds as well as the uh, remaining state reimbursements and so forth. But um, as you look at the year-to-date report, you'll notice that we are, you know, we're at that point. Um, other than that, this is, this is a slow month for us. Uh, next month we will have a lot of things for you for year-end. Uh, with insurance items, uh, treasurer's bond, um, all of those catch-up things that come in in June uh, for the beginning of the next year and wrapping up of, the, of, the, of this year. Uh, you do have one item um, on the agenda, and that's a, a construction piece, and that is for the owner's uh, risk insurance for the phase one elementaries. Uh, the board had approved the middle school uh, insurance uh, previously, I think that was in March. Uh, this one is for the phase one elementaries. So as as each phase of the construction goes out and gets bid, and we have a number to, to go against them. We submit that to our our insurance. Um, our general insurance is property casualty is with travel is um, I'm sorry Liberty Mutual, and uh, so they are the ones that have uh, that coverage with us, and then we get that quote based on the valuation of, of the, of the uh, work to be done uh, for the summer. So you'll see, you'll, you'll have that on there for approval. Uh, we are effective of the beginning of the date of um, May 1st uh, when construction, when we started working in the evenings on, on buildings. So uh, other than that, uh, we don't, I don't have anything else unless there are questions. Thank you. Questions or comments? Thank you, Todd. All right, that brings us to committees. Uh, first up is the policy committee. While it did not meet since the last board meeting, we do have up for first reading press issue 114. So, uh, Dr. Harris? Are we, are we taking action on that? This is going to be the, we're, we're going to, yes. No, so we're not, we're not, not taking we're, not take, we're not approving it, but do we have to like. This is the first reading. This first like, reading. We don't have to take action to display it or anything like that? No, we typically okay. yeah. we'll right. first reading. Just to be for first reading, right. so I will do a voice call. Okay. Yeah. I was just yeah. Okay. So, so your first okay. rodeo, Greg? <laughs> no, I was wondering, <laughs> is there going to be an action, and, or is there going to be a motion? No, I so there is a motion. Have to, okay. Yeah, do you want me to do that first well, before you present? That's what I'm just asking. Is it appropriate to speak now, or should, never mind. Just, I'm going to talk all right. now, all right? Is <laughs> so, there a motion to approve the first reading for the You're policies awesome. in the press <laughs> issue 114 as presented in the attached drafts? So moved. Second. All right, I need to discuss. And I do have some discussion. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is um, so this good. is a, 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 a list of policies that are being brought to the board for first reading that do not have a, a meeting attached to it. And the reason why is because we looked at the, the most recent press update, and uh, Dr. Russell and Member Wine and I agree that there is that, that everything in this update is just legal updates, footnotes, things like that. There is nothing of substance that would have necessitated bringing a committee together at 7 a.m. and using up a lot of good people's uh, valuable time. So um, we just, we felt, we felt okay not um, bringing this, not having a meeting first to go over this, like we would, would be our normal routine. Um, of course, because this is our first reading, we're not approving anything tonight. The, the board and the community have time to look over this before we um, bring it back next month for a second reading and for adoption. Um, if, they think, if, they, if there's anything concerning to anybody, but we didn't think that it was going to be the case. So, but if there is anything, we could of course have that discussion later on, or tonight, or whatever. All right. So, are there any other questions, comments? All right. Um, um, well, I guess it is a roll call. Will we please call roll? <laughs> it could be a voice. I thought that's what it was. Yeah. It could be a voice. <laughs> All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. The motion carried to approve for first reading the policies and press issue 114 as presented in the attached drafts. Uh, legislative committee has not met, neither is the financial advisory committee, uh, neither has the district leadership team. The health and wellness committee did meet on May the 7th, 2024. So, Vice President Harris, you're up again. Me again. Okay. So, the health and wellness committee met. Um, there are, as Todd alluded to, there are going to be a couple of items from our discussions that end up on the June agenda. Um, one of them is going to be uh, just kind of a, a retooling of our, of our wellness incentives 
in order to entice more of our members to participate in the wellness program. The other one is our stop loss insurance, which I am pleased to report it, uh, our, our deductible is staying flat, which I think it was last year when it went from 150 to 175. Or was it two years? A couple years, yeah. Okay, so anyway, but it went up by, by quite a bit of money um, a, a year or two ago. But the actually, this year we're actually saving money on our, our premiums, so that's good. Um, and then we are, we had, we looked at data last week through March 31st, so we're still in the early part of the year, but we are uh, trending very nicely. And, um, you know, knock on wood, um, we, we have reason to be hopeful for a, a renewal in the, um, as, as of January 1st, where we won't see our, our premiums increase like they have in the previous years. So that's, uh, we have reason for optimism for that, but there's still a lot more time to go. So, cautiously optimistic. Um, anything else, Todd, to throw in there? Okay. Oh, well, let's get the Yep, just, uh, just we talked about the wallets and sentences. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Any questions? Thank you, Greg. Uh, the SAS report uh, was part of your uh, superintendent's report. So, is there any questions, though, for Kevin regarding the SAS? All right, then we'll move on. We have no discussion items tonight. So that brings us to public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but is not intended to be a time for members of the public to uh, engage with a dialogue, in, into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to future agenda items or addressed by administrative staff when it is appropriate. The board has allocated 30 minutes tonight. We ask that each of you keep your comments to three minutes to allow everyone the opportunity to speak. Uh, I didn't see anyone drop off any. Are there any cards over there? No, no cards? All right, so we do not have any cards, but I will open the floor. If there's anyone that wants to make a public comment, I invite you to step up to the podium and uh, say your name and attendance area and give your comment. Okay. Um, that brings us then to approval of minutes. Are there any suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? If not, is there a motion to approve the minutes from April 8th, 2024 as regular meeting as presented? So, so moved. moved. Second. All right, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried to approve the minutes of the April 8th, 2024 regular meeting as presented. Uh, we have a consent agenda tonight. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements consisting of the list of bills and summary? So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. We have some items tonight recommended for action. The first up is the final 2023 through 2024 school calendar. Is there a motion to approve the final 2023 through 2024 calendar, the school calendar as presented? So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried to approve the final 2023 through 2024 school calendar as presented. Uh, we have the Board of Education meeting calendar. Is there a motion to approve the Board of Education meeting calendar for the 24, 20, uh, 2024 through 2025 year as presented? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion on that? I just had a thought when we were looking at um, there's some school sites, TBD, on our workshops. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure you're ahead of me on this one, but it would be great if we could get those at the phase one elementary schools so we could, so the board could maybe have a tour beforehand to see all, have the opportunity mm -hmm. to see all the work that's been done. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah that's worth having a conversation on. Uh, we were actually in the process of talking about moving, now that we're gonna be in the new facility, just a lot of those, and when we, when we don't tour the buildings, we'll do that, but actually for these next couple of years, it's not, uh, it's not a bad idea if we have an opportunity to see uh, s some of those new facilities. Can I have one question. Yeah. Is it is it really going to be in the new mm -hmm. civic center? Yeah. So let me give you an update. I was going to say now. that's like a <laughs> so bearing the lead here. Yeah. Yeah. So um, <laughs> tentatively, uh, the village has informed me that their first meeting in July, which will be a week ahead of ours, will be in the new civic center. Mm. And so then, of course, I asked was that mean that we can go in the new civic center? And they said yes. Um, all that is obviously tentative, pending uh, the construction schedule stays on schedule for them, but they are on schedule. So right now the police are scheduled to move in in early June, which is only in a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. And the village will follow a week after that and they'll start utilizing the uh, new boardroom. I have had the opportunity to be inside of it. Uh, 
while I love this room, it is a significant upgrade <laughs> and uh, very excited uh, to be in there. So I am anticipating uh, July unless something changes. And then, of course, I would let you know at the June meeting that we'll be here. Uh, Melissa's already on top of the, the new address for the facility, which will be uh, Curtis Street. Our suite will be Suite 200, uh, matching what we currently have at the uh, Aramark building. So uh, we're all set. Yeah. There's, there's light fixtures hung, and I yeah, saw it on site yeah, today. Yeah, there, there's <laughs> light fixtures, doors, yeah, nice it, it is a quite an impressive um, building, and, and we're very excited, and certainly, uh, if we do host our meeting there, uh, we could gavel in at, at 6 and, uh, you know, see if the village could arrange a tour for us and uh, you could get a, a chance to see uh, the closed session room, our, our new office suite and everything. So we're, we're very excited to be over there. Very cool. Yay. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? <laughs> all right. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried to approve the Board of Education meeting calendar for the 24-25 uh, uh, school year. Uh, we have a uh, PE waiver application. Is there a motion to approve the application for the waiver or modification of school code man uh, uh, mandates as presented? So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion? No? Okay. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the application for, um, for waiver or modification of the school code mandates as presented. We have the Rexnard property tax abatement. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution authorizing property tax abatement for the Rexnard facility for the 2023 tax year as presented? So moved. All so right. Back up. <laughs> Any discussion? Melissa, please go roll. Member Harris. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to adopt the resolution authorizing the property tax abatement for the Rexnard facility for the 2023 tax year as presented. We have an addendum to the DGESP contract. Is there a motion to approve the addendum to the DGESP contract um, April 2024 as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Is there any, is it, I don't know how much we've talked about this in public, so I don't know if somebody wants to just give a brief a statement on what this is. Just uh, I'll give a, a brief on it, Justin. Please jump in. Uh, so under Illinois law, any group that is not represented by a union or an association has the right to join that association if they meet the criteria established by the Illinois Education Labor Relations Board. Uh, there are two types of nurses in our, our district. Excuse me. We have certified school nurses, uh, which are already in the teachers collective bargaining unit. And then we have um, registered nurses that are not in uh, the teacher's unit uh, because they're more hourly employees. Uh, the registered nurses have joined um, or have sought to join the um, Downers Grove, I'm, I'm gonna mess up the acronym here, our support staff union. Uh, they went through all the proper certification with the Illinois Labor, uh, Illinois Education Labor Relations Board. They met the criteria, and so we entered into contract negotiations with them. Uh, the reason this is a simple amendment is because when you add a group on mid-contract, it is just an amendment adding them on. So this amendment really just calls out the uh, registered nurses and how they will fit into the bargaining unit. And then the next time we negotiate this contract, it'll be a, a more comprehensive contract that will have the secretary's instructional assistance and then the registered nurses in our building all under the same collective bargaining unit. Is that okay? I think you got it. All right, thank you. <laughs> all right. Um, but if there's a, any questions or comments on this? All right, most please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the addendum to the DGESP contract April 2024 as presented. We have a projector purchase from middle schools. Is there a motion to approve the purchase of 25 Epson PowerLite 770F? Uh, for a total cost of $37,175 from CDWG. So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion? Let's please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the purchase of the 25 Epson PowerLite 770F for a total cost of $37,175 from CDWG. Oops. All right. 
Next up is the staff MacBook purchase. Is there a motion to approve the purchase of 100 MacBook Airs for a total cost of $77,900 from Apple? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to approve the purchase of 100 MacBook Airs for a total cost of $77,900 from Apple. We have a seventh grade Chromebook purchase. Is there a motion to approve the purchase of 560 Acer 311 Chromebooks, uh, which include Google device licenses for a total cost of $127,680 from CDWG? So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the purchase of 560 Acer 311 Chromebooks, which include Google device licenses, for a total cost of $127,680 from CDWG. We have surplus equipment. Is there a motion to designate as surplus equipment those items listed in the attached memo? So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion on that? Uh, Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Uh, the motion carried to designate the, uh, as surplus equipment the, those items listed in the attached memo. We have uh, builder's risk insurance for the phase one elementary schools. Is there a motion to approve the owner's builder's risk insurance with Liberty Insurance for the phase one elementary schools in the amount of $40,980? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Number Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannah. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the owner's builders, uh, uh, the owner's builders risk insurance with Liberty Insurance for the phase one elementary schools in the amount of $40,980. We have a construction consent agenda tonight. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? Um, I just have a question on A. So. Then I have to pull that out. Pull that. All right. Let me write. It's an easy one. So let me write a motion for it. Hold on a second. All right. So is there, um, do I have a motion to approve the construction consent agenda consisting of all items listed with the exception of item A, project authorization phase one elementary schools? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Uh, uh, Melissa, will you please go roll? Member Ellis. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the consent agenda um, as modified without item A, project authorization phase one elementary schools. Is there a motion to approve item A, project authorization phase one elementary schools? So moved. Second. All right. Um, any discussion? Yeah, just a real simple question. I just wanted to confirm there's going to be a superintendent on each of the four sites full time? Yes. 40 hours a week, separate, different people, right? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thanks. For the audience, uh, Boleen Andrews answered that question. Yeah. Construction <laughs> Thank <and> you. <laughs> no need to come up here. I just wanted to confirm because I broke out the hourly rates and I'm like, I just want to make sure. <laughs> okay. Any other comments or questions on this particular item? All right, and Melissa, will you please call roll? Um, did we have me? I made the motion. Thank you. <laughs> and I seconded. All right, Member Harris. Aye. Member um, Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Um, we motion that was approved uh, on item A, project authorization phase one elementary schools. We have a couple of announcements. Uh, Monday, May 20th at 345 p.m., the district leadership team will meet at O'Neill Middle School. On Friday, June 7th at 7 a.m., the financial advisory committee will meet. It says to be determined location uh, is normally at O'Neill. Remember that O'Neill, um, I think we're at 
I'm just going off the fly here, but I think that to be determined was whether or not I was going to be in the uh, professional development room or whether in the library. Let's schedule it for the library and we will send a message out. But, uh, but it will night, take place at O'Neill Middle School. Uh, it'll take place at O'Neill Middle School. And then Monday, June 10th at 7 p.m. will be a regular board meeting right back here at Village Hall. Maybe our last meeting here at this Village Hall. So, Just a check i think the dlt is going to be on the 21st not on the 20th that is correct dlt will be on the 21st which is a tuesday two, okay so tuesday may tuesday may 21st still at 3 45 p.m still at o'neill middle school thank just you just coming back to fac if there is an issue with construction we will publicly notify everyone okay. of the different location as well as send something out to the uh, financial advisor committee on june 7th we might not be able to be at o'neill so but i will circle back to the group all right appreciate that mm -hmm. any items i don't need Okay. The board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to be moved to closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the district? That's 5 ILCS 122C1. The collective negotiating matters between the public body and its employees or their representatives or deliberations concerning salary schedules for one or more classes of employees. That's 5 ILCS uh, 122C2. The consideration of student disciplinary matters. It's 5 ILCS 122C9. The placement of individual students in special education programs or other matters related to individual students. It's 5 ILCS 122C10. And the discussion of minutes of meetings lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act, whether for the purposes of the approval of the body of the minutes or the semi-annual review of minutes, is mandated by Section 2.06. That's 5, ILC, uh, 5 ILCS 122C21. Uh, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All right. Any discussion on that? All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Did the motion carry? The board will now meet in closed session after a short recess. Let's try to meet by 825.